Hi, welcome to another edition of City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kozmowski. My, Mayor, thank you for being with us today. Oh, absolutely. Good to see you, Walt. So this is, uh, today's December 15th, and it's probably the last city scene that we're going to do uh, for the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on your uh, your election win here a few weeks ago. Thanks. Uh, and maybe uh, what I'd like to have you do for our audience is maybe reflect with us a little bit on some of the work you've done as mayor and what, what does the future for Beverly look like? Big question. <laughs> uh, so a little, little look back and a, and a look forward all at once. Uh, you know, it's, I've been mayor for four years very quickly. Uh, it feels like it's been very quick and uh, it's been great. I absolutely love going to work every day. I love, you know, serving the people of Beverly and I think we've done some good things together. Uh, I think we're in, a, we're in a very strong position financially as a community. We've been able to um, fund our, our, you know, needed programs and services. We're, uh, we've been able to put money away in a, in a stabilization fund, recognizing that if you don't have some savings, the next time the economy turns down, then you're in trouble. That's so right. yep. I think we've done a great job with that. We, uh, we've moved the middle school project forward to where, you know, we're hoping to, uh, we're expecting, <laughs> expecting and hoping to, you know, take um, control of the school by the end of, uh, end of this current school year yep. so that we have the whole summer for the transition in right. uh, to open for next fall. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, mm. later on in the program. So, yeah, just a, a, there's, there's lots. There's lots. I mean, we, we've made a big priority of trying to fix roads and sidewalks and improve uh, traffic flow and improve safety at, at, at various intersections. And so we've, we've been, you know, we've been in a pretty good economy. And when you're in a, a good economy, you can make some of the right investments. When, when the economy's tougher, you just flat out can't. Yeah. So we're trying to do everything we can with infrastructure work right now uh, so that you know, we're in a better place. Yeah. So let me, talking about that, um, <clears throat> one of the major uh, achievements of your administration, uh, Mike, has been the revitalization and redevelopment of, of Beverly's downtown. Mm -hmm. So kind of review some of that with us and talk about some of the, both the public and the private projects mm -hmm. and their importance to the city. Sure. Well, first I'd say some of, some of what's going on downtown has been, you know, I've been fortunate to be in office while the economy's gotten better and people have made private investments. So there's that. Uh, you know, we've tried to do the right things. I, I think, you know, the city put in place partly while I was on the city council, uh, partly when I wasn't and, and before I became mayor, um, you know, some important um, uh, zoning opportunities for uh, transit-oriented development in the right. downtown along Rantoul Street, particularly near the train station. Uh, we need housing. We need housing of all types. And the best place for housing is near public transportation. Right. When you build it near public transportation, uh, it brings fewer vehicles. And those vehicles take fewer trips. They stay right. in, in people's garages more of the week. Um, so when people, when people live closer to public transit, they, just, they walk more. Uh, they drive less. Uh, and we need that housing for a lot of reasons. Um, one of which is the more people living downtown helps to really bring back uh, your downtown retail and commercial Absolutely. sector, and that's yep. been going on. Yep. Um, Infrastructure-wise, we've all been living through the Rantoul Street Route 1A project, and it's been a it's been a long, I suppose I guess it's been a long and winding road. It's fairly straight road. Straight but, road. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it's been it's been a hard project. It's been a great project. Yeah. You know, we we uh, we spent uh, money to engineer the project, and then the state. And federal dollars that came in to build it, and we're just about done. Yeah. Um, just about done. There's there's just a, a little bit of, you know, punch list work they call it. You know, yeah. last uh, last wrap up kind of work to be done in the spring. Uh, but the paving's all done. The sidewalks are all done. The the you know all the major parts of the project are done. And you can see Rantoul Street is a much, um, you know, much better place to be right now. Much and, nicer. Yeah. And you also see the investment that has gone on uh, with some really good. Uh, mixed-use development, redevelopment projects. Um, most recently, what's opened is the, the flats at 131, the, the building that uh, was built by Beverly Crossing and Windover next to the post office. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, you know, people that, that's fully uh, occupied, and we've got, uh, we've got a couple great restaurants on the ground floor, and, um, and you look on a you look at night and they're, you know, they're banged out, they're full and people are having a great time. Which is, yeah. Uh, so there's, it, there's a lot going on that's great. Yep, yeah. uh, on Cabot Street, we have really focused on trying to improve 
uh, intersections with, um, uh, you know, rebuilding some of the intersections right. with bump outs and improving the sidewalks. We've done some of that on our own, and we have an application into the state for more uh, Complete Streets grant funding to help us do more of that in the next yeah. couple of years. Yeah, and uh, I, I think uh, it serves to remind our viewers that the the 1A project, the Rantoul Street project, that was funded by the state, right? How, how much mm -hmm. did the city put into that? The city put in just about four million for engineering, and the state put in almost 21 million for construction. Yeah. Yeah, and and, uh, and and we keep saying Rantoul, but it's also that stretch of Cabot, right, from Gloucester Crossing up uh, just past the Dairy Queen to the New Middle School. Right, right. And and you were talking a little bit more about uh, earlier about the uh, street work and the intersections. I think that intersection of that what, what you're just talking about there mm -hmm. really works much better now. It's it it looks better. It works better. It it's uh, it it's it's car friendly and and. Uh, I, I, it, it, that that intersection, I hated going through that. Gloucester Crossing. Yeah. When I got my driver's license, it was just a couple of stop signs. There was yeah. no traffic light there, and it was uh, it was a, it was an adventure. Yeah. Uh, what the state insisted on was that when that when that intersection was rebuilt with this project, that it tried to direct people to to, to get onto Rantoul Street, yeah. not to stay on Cabot, yeah. because the the numbered route Route One A as it comes into Beverly from Salem. It goes up Rantoul and then turns left turns on Cabot. Like, right. So they wanted the dominant movement to be right. Rantoul to Cabot, Cabot to Rantoul on that stretch. Uh, and that's, that's why it's somewhat differently configured than we're used to as yeah, well. Yeah, right, right. Now, as long as we're talking about roads and things like that, um, you've done a lot of work. Your administration has done a lot of work with the downtown parking and this new scheme, the new, new uh, 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 paradigm for parking. Update us on that. What, what's the theory behind it, and, and where do we stand right now with the parking yes. downtown? So a lot of it has been focused on kind of bringing our parking technology into the 21st century. Um, and, and with that, a value on trying to make sure that there always are available spaces along the main street. Now, you don't want the main street to be empty of cars, but to make sure that people, as they're driving up and down the main street, can find an open space within a block. Right. Uh, and that's the goal of it. Um, trying to direct more people to park in the parking lots yep. or on the side streets by making that cheaper. Right and making it a little more expensive to park right out at the front right door of the right, business. Right. Um, so that's a part of it. One of the other values, though, that we had was to make sure that everybody could park for free for those quick errands. Yeah. If you're going in to make a deposit at the bank, if you're going in to get a cup of coffee, you know, if you're going in to, to, to pick up a book at the bookstore that, you know, that they ordered for you, yeah. if, it's a, if it's a quick errand, people should be able to just pull up, find a spot, walk in, walk out. So the first 15 minutes will always be free with this new system. I should say the new system is not going to be implemented until July 1st. Yeah. Because we need to uh, decide on the kiosk equipment, the enforcement equipment, and order it. Right. We've been working with vendors, but until the, uh, until the, the city council approved the ordinance change, it didn't make sense to, you know, to, sure. to move ahead with sure. that. Uh, so that was approved just recently. And... Um, uh, in fact, their final vote is tonight. Yeah, I'm sorry, next Monday. Next Monday. Uh, yeah. But so, so again, the, the multiple goals are to make sure that there are available spaces in front of businesses, try to incentivize people to park a little further away if they can and want to, yeah. um, uh, to save a little bit of money. So um, the, what we're projecting are uh, 75 cents an hour right in front of stores on the main street, right. 50 cents an hour a bit further down some of the side streets and 25 cents an hour in all the parking lots. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the concept is like if you're going to uh, a concert or you're going to a, uh, a sporting event, if you want to be right next to home plate, you're going to pay more. If you're in the bleachers, you pay a little bit less, right? Well, so if you go to Gillette, <laughs> you, you, you can park for a little less if you're further down Route 1, right? <laughs> uh, the other pe but you're right, you're right. The other piece of it is uh, there'll be a lot of spaces that will be free, and those will be on the side streets, essentially between Rantoul and Cabot. Right. Along those side streets, there'll be free time-limited parking. We're looking at a four-hour limit. Um, and then residents can get uh, resident passes or res resident registration right. uh, to park for free at all times. Okay. on those side streets. All right. Now, one final question. Uh, you talked about the kiosk. So explain to our viewers, are, are the existing meters now going to be torn out? And the, what, what, the what meters, will they see in July? The meters will go. And the ways that people will be able to pay for parking will be, you can download an app on your phone and pay by, by app, which a lot of us already do in other communities. 
So you could you could pay buy app as you pull up to the space, and then if you're shopping or if you're in having lunch or coffee and you realize you're about to run out of time, you can just go on your phone and boom, buy boom, more boom. time. Right. The other ways you can pay are at the kiosks, and we'll be uh, putting kiosks every several car lengths will be a kiosk. Right. Um, and you will you'll be able to pay either by coins, bills, or credit card at the kiosks. Okay. And the best thing about the kiosks is they won't will not be pay and display. So if you go to a kiosk and you pay for your parking, you don't then have to go back to your car. Ah, you can okay. go right on with your with right. your errands. Right. But but it, they'll they'll be similar to the, the uh, kiosks that are in back of of. Uh, uh, where the Casa de Moda in, in the, the parking in, in the parking lot. Sim similar, 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 yeah, similar structurally they'll be similar. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we touched upon it a little bit earlier. Uh, tell us uh, the, the middle school, the new middle school. Uh, uh, construction is winding down and as you say, uh, we'll be able to take possession of that before the beginning of, of uh, the September mm -hmm. school term. So tell us where that stands. Uh, is it on time? Is it on budget? Uh, give us an overview of that, Mike. Yes, uh, right now it's, it's both. Yeah. Uh, and so what remains, what still needs to happen at the middle school, I mean, there's obviously a lot of construction that still needs to go on. It's all in, it's all interior. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've closed the building up, which is great. Last winter, we, it was still kind of open to the elements. Right. Um, the plan is that the major construction will all be done by the end of March. That's the goal. So that um, over those next couple of months, all of the, what we call the Furniture, fixtures, and equipment, the okay. FF&E. FF &E. All the things that go into the school, cabinetry, desks, um, uh, smart boards, all that kind of technology, will all, will all be able to be um, uh, installed. And then the technology that we purchase will all arrive and, and be, uh, be brought in. And that all is meant to happen during the spring months with a goal of having the building turned over to us so that the teachers can move in at the end of this current school year yeah. and then we'll have the summer to make sure to, everybody's yeah. settled in and ready to, to open that will also be important for the elementary schools because the fifth graders will be moving up right. which will allow elementary schools to reconfigure as k-4 to schools right, right and most of our elementary schools are using special spaces as regular classrooms meaning the science room, the music room, the art room. Oh, okay. Most of our ele elementary schools are using something that wasn't mm -hmm. built technically to be a regular classroom yeah. for classes. Yeah. And that's a part of, you know, part of why it's important to get the middle school finalized, the fifth graders come up and that space gets, right, right. Uh, gets restored for the elementary school's needs. Right. And of course, uh, uh, among uh, the uh, elements of the uh, technological infrastructure in the new middle school will be a hot studio set, such as yes. the one we're sitting in here in, in the high school. Uh, so we're going to push the media uh, learning and the ability of the students to, uh, to create media and television and so forth uh, down into the, into the middle school level, which is... And where which will is, that be located? Well, that's going to be in the in the uh, library area, right? Adjacent the learning to the media center. The media center. The library media center. Media yeah. center, right? That's, so it's we'll, a great space. Yeah. We we toured it a couple of weeks ago to see where things are at. It's looking fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're excited about that, and mm -hmm. of course, Bev Cam's involvement in that. We're we're so happy to work with the with the city and the mm -hmm. and the and the school district. Uh, All on those, exciting on those kinds of things. Now, uh, so let's talk about the other half of that. So. Uh, the kids are going to be moving out of Briscoe and into the new middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there have been a lot of meetings and a committee. But bring our audience up to date. What, what sure. is, are the plans or the potential plans for Briscoe at this point? No, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so we did. We spent almost a year, eight or nine months, with a, a, a committee that was put together and a, a public, set of public meetings and process around you know, the reuse of Briscoe, but also the reuse of the police station and city hall. We were looking at that time to determine whether it made any sense to keep Briscoe and try to move City Hall there and build a new police station as part of the, you know, one of the, the first floor wings at Briscoe, uh, because we know we need a new police station as well. And we don't have enough space at City Hall for all, all of our municipal offices. Several are, you know, right, you call them off campus or right. different places yep. around the city. Um, what we found, um, what we found was this. If we sell Briscoe, 
keep City Hall where it is, build a new police station on the two-acre parcel at, at the front of the coming center coming that center. has been available to the city for the past 20 years. Yep. Um, it's actually, you know, under our ownership. Um, the total cost for building the new police station at coming center and rehabbing the existing police station from municipal offices is pegged at about $27, $28 million. Mm -hmm. The total cost for moving City Hall to Briscoe building a new police station within the Briscoe structure um, would be in the range of, and we were given a range of 55 to $70 million. So mm -hmm. it's under 30 versus call it 60. Yeah. And that really made the decision. We, you know, we can't, can't ask the taxpayers of Beverly to fund that. Yeah. Uh, something that's twice as expensive or potentially more than twice as expensive. So that leaves us not really able to utilize Briscoe. Uh, so the next step is to figure out how do we, you know, how do we, dispose of is a bad word, but how do we take the next step with mm -hmm. Briscoe? And what I, uh, what I hope to do is have a couple of uh, community meetings on this in, in January, maybe late January, early February, uh, mid-January, to just do some brainstorming. Also to share a few ideas, because we're brainstorming already as right. well. And, you know, um, I've, I've thought, you know, should we... Should the city keep the whole parcel, which is close to seven acres, and use it as green space, as a park? Mm -hmm. um, should, we, um, should we just put it out on the open market and see what people want to do yeah. with it, you know, what, what the private uh, investment world would do with it? Or do we want to target how we would ask? We have <clears throat> a significant need for affordable housing for senior citizens in Beverly, housing for people who are ready to kind of need to downsize from the homes they raised their families in, uh, and they find it hard to, to find a place in Beverly that they can afford to, to move into once they sell their homes. Possibility for that, uh, possibility that some part of the building can be preserved. The costs of preservation and rehab and modernization and up, upgrades for the building are significant. So I don't know that it's possible that the whole structure could be preserved, yeah. but can some part of it be preserved along with a, t a tear down of the rest of it and rebuild? Uh, what would be the right use? Would it yeah. be some senior housing? Would it be some combined use housing and other things? Uh, would it be, would it be, would it make sense for the city to sell off a part of the parcel, including the building and keep, keep title selling. to a part of the parcel for parkland? Yeah. So those lot, are some of the things. That it, options, it, yeah. There are options. And, and, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that we've been advised uh, by some state, uh, agencies is to put an RFI out, a request for interest. Okay. Where it would be more of a brainstorming of any entity that might be interested in in, uh, in possibly developing. Yeah. Um, so I think it's it, it's a we need to go through this process in a fairly expeditious way because we don't want the building to sit vacant for a long time. Yeah. Um, so we'll be looking, as I said, to have a couple of public conversations about this early in the calendar year, and then try to you know take that input. And sure. you know, and move forward. Sure. Now, uh, a question I have from what you've said: if, if whatever we do, whether the city keeps it, and mm -hmm. it is so, parts of the building are usable as is. If you kind of clean it out, so the skeleton is still usable, or like with the old middle school, would it have to be completely torn down? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, you know, what we found through the the process that we undertook is yeah. that the the rehab costs are significant. Yeah. And and you know. Who will be willing to invest in purchasing the property and rehabbing? Yeah. What are the available, you know, sources of funds beyond somebody's private capital? Right. You know, are there grant opportunities for some historic preservation? Um, we know that there, you know, that there are uh, that we know that there are funding streams for uh, affordable housing of different profiles. So, yeah. you know, I think that's why everything needs to be on the table right now as we look at it. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we'll, we'll be looking for some input, both from the, you know, the public as well as those who may be in a position to try to invest their own money in, in actually doing the work. Right. Now, you just mentioned affordable housing, and I know that your administration has really had that, you know, sort of at the top of their agenda uh, mm -hmm. during your term in office. Where, where do we stand with affordable housing in, in Beverly, and what, what are we doing, Mike? Mm -hmm. So we have, when, when you look at the state statute around affordable housing, the 40B, 40B statute, B, yep. there's, a, there's, a, there's a way they categorize housing, and if it's subsidized at, you know, certain levels of income, um, 
and those subsidies protect the the uh, the property, the housing unit as an affordable unit, then you get credit for that on the 40B count. We're at about 11 and a half percent of our housing stock, our, all of our units of housing in the city uh, are on that list as affordable. Yeah. If you're over 10 percent, right. then you're not subject to 40B, meaning a developer can't come in and drop a, a, a big affordable development wherever they want, regardless of zoning. Yeah. So that's an important thing to be is above 10%. Absolutely, yeah. We also recognize that both the local need and the regional need is much greater than 10%. Yeah. There are, there are you know, the, the number of people who live in Beverly who are what, what you would call housing stressed, they spend too much of their monthly Local income, income yeah. annual income on their housing, more than you know, any measure is, is deemed to be really uh, sustainable or healthy for your kind of financial health. Um, too many people pay too much of their income for their housing. So we do need more affordable opportunities in the city. And that's why we've been, you know, we've been trying to be both aggressive and thoughtful and measured about it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we just recently went to the council and the council approved a 40R um, rezone for the parcel of land just up the hill from here, mm -hmm. right on the corner of right. Sawyer and Tozer Road. Right. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the hope is that uh, there will be a family, affordable family housing development that goes in there where 15 of the units are, are targeted for homeless families or families at risk of homelessness. Yeah. And the other 60 units will be uh, targeted for workforce housing, families that earn under 60% of area median income. So you could be earning $55,000 up to 65, or 65, I think, or so a year uh, as a family of four and qualify for that kind of support, that kind of subsidy. Because at that income level, you still are paying too much of your income sure. for your housing, yeah. you can't afford other necessities. Yeah, and of course, Andrew DeFranza and Harbolite are the, 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 they're the project managers, or they're the ones that will own that, and, right? And that's right, we, the rezone wasn't specific to Harbolite, uh, um, Harbolite Community Partners. However, they control the, the land, they have a, an option to purchase right. the land. So if it goes forward, it will be Harborlight that develops it. Yes, right. and, and they're a great partner. They, they do a fantastic job oh, they do, of yeah. managing the properties they own. Turtle Creek, uh, Turtle Woods, the, the properties up, up on the top of the hill in Centerville, um, Harbor Light House, uh, and, and they have other properties. Yeah. So we have a lot of confidence in them uh, building quality housing and managing over the long term. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the supports that they propose to bring to those families that move in there are significant as yeah, well. Yeah. Now, as long as we're talking about pieces of property, uh, can you uh, give our, uh, our viewers an update on the so-called McDonald's property down on mm. the, at the base of the, mm -hmm. of the Salem Beverly Bridge? What's, what's right. happening there, Mike? Boy, I hope we're, I hope we're close. Um, there were two big stumbling blocks to that property. One was the designated port area, right, which, which we, we were able to eliminate in my right. first term in office. <clears throat> and the second was the nature of the public access, access requirements that the state imposed because we purchased the land, the property, partly with state grant money. Right. And the state grant money was uh, what they call urban self-help grant, which was meant to improve public access to and enjoyment of space, you know, public spaces in and around a downtown. So in this case, being at the waterfront, it, it meant public access on that parcel. Right. We were able to get the state to agree with us that uh, public access can be provided in a number of different ways, some, in, some within the footprint of the building, but others outside of the footprint of the building. And that was a big, uh, you know, that was a big agreement because it had been the case that whoever would build a restaurant there had to give over the whole ground floor to complete public access, right. which meant they couldn't put the kitchen on the first floor, they couldn't do any restaurant seating on the first floor. Yeah. So that was really standing in the way. And we were able to, to change that and get an agreement with the state earlier this calendar year. Uh, so that's a big improvement. Um, what has continued to be a challenge is the, the financials for somebody to both build the building and then when the building is built, pay a ground lease, pay property taxes on the building, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, and pay their lease to their landlord. So there, there are a lot of things that the restaurant would need to do, the combination of the restaurant and, and the uh, property owner. So what we've kind of determined, learned from talking with different restaurant groups and developers, uh, it seems that the right profile is a shared ownership model where whoever owns it is also the restaurant tour. 
at least in part, at least part ownership and, and operate of the restaurant. Um, and the, the, the numbers, when they do the pro formas and they look at what type of gross uh, business they project that they can do over 12 months, it has to be able to right. handle those, other, those costs right. for them. And it, it's been problematic. We've had some very high quality um, restaurant groups very seriously look at this and want very much to do this and not be ready to pull the trigger because of the concerns around the, the margins, the financial margins, sure. which has made it clear to us that there, there most likely needs to be some financial, uh, some tax incentive involved in the early years to get somebody in and up and running. Uh, and given that this property has brought zero dollars in tax revenue to the city since we've owned it for 20 years, to get this thing done and done right, um, to get a reputable, high-quality restaurant group, development group in there, and to tee them up to be successful um, on a site that has, to this point, proven problematic to develop, yeah. uh, it really, that really speaks to the need for some tax incentive. Uh, it would need to be properly structured, but I really believe it needs to be there. Um, and that's, that's our goal. Now, I think we're closer because now that the, the conversation about tax incentive is on the table, you know, those, those groups that have been interested are going back, right. sharpening They'll, their pencils, looking back at exactly. their performers, looking at what, you know, what can work. And the thing is, once we put an RFP out, which we're required to do by law, we can't talk with anybody anymore until the RFP process is over and we've selected someone. Oh, so it. we're talking with anybody who will talk with us, trying to, trying to just get as many high-quality uh, teams to where they feel they're ready to bid, and then we'll put the RFP out. I've had hopes for some time now that we'd have a restaurant open by the spring of 2019. I don't think that that's really the timetable anymore. There's a six to nine month permitting window, and then there's about a one year construction uh, time frame. So, you know, we're not, we're not going to have it, we're not going to open the door and serve food as quickly as I'd hoped. But there have been a lot of pieces to this, and I feel like we're moving forward yeah, uh, in a way that we'll, we'll get something that the community will will love and that will really, really kind of be the big, the big piece to activate that waterfront in the way that we hope for yeah. decades to come. Now, we only have about a minute left, Mike. Um, the, the city seems to be in a very um, strong financial position. Mm -hmm. So share with our viewers how the city's financial status affects capital projects. We have about a, sure. about a minute, uh, if you could oh, bring our viewers a up. A minute to on that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we've, we've managed to uh, take advantage of, of low interest rates. We've managed to, uh, uh, to take advantage of some good new growth numbers each year, and we built our rainy day fund. Uh, we'll be going to the council in January to request another $3 million into the rainy day fund to take it to about 10% of our annual operating budget. Uh, we'll also be asking for money, uh, some of the, the uh, free cash money, to be dedicated to doing the um, design work on the new police station. Uh, so... We're, we're looking to move, you know, move ahead with the police station. Being able to do that as quickly as we're trying to do it um, is something we weren't able to think of two, three years ago. But the, the ability to, to, keep the, uh, to borrow at low rates on the middle school project, to keep that within its budget, right. uh, and to continue to see strong uh, performance locally with our, with our economic investment has allowed us to, to really look ahead to do that. Yeah. Uh, more effectively and, and more quickly. Yeah, that, that, that's a good position to be in. You know? mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you, Mike. Thank I'd you like all. to remind our viewers that you have been watching City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next year. Thanks, Walt.